Well, tonight we are going to be looking at the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. The Gospels record that during the six hours that Jesus was hanging on the cross, he made seven, seven different statements or seven different sayings, if you will. And these are sayings that have tremendous significance. Um, there's a lot packed into these seven sayings. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, and it's hard to think it through in a sense that we've never been crucified and been on a cross before. I don't think I would even have the strength to say anything, and yet here is our Messiah, here is Jesus, our Savior, communicating from the cross and doing this because he loves us and he loves those that were there as well. And so we'll see this demonstrates Jesus was not only consistent in his life and his message, but also consistent uh, in the way that he demonstrated uh, those as well. So Luke chapter 23, verse 34, is the first of the sayings. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This first of the seven sayings that Christ uh, says, demonstrates that he was thinking about others, even on the cross. Thinking about you, thinking about me, even to the end of his life. And as he was experiencing that horrible pain in the crucifixion, he was praying for those that caused the suffering, those that had flogged him, those that put the crown of thorns upon his head, those that had crucified him. And so we see that he came to the earth for that purpose, to forgive sinners. He came to the, the earth to rescue us because he loves us and desires to forgive us for our sins. And so it was because of man's sin that he went to the cross suffering on behalf of our sins. And we see that's really the heart of the Lord is, is that our sins would be forgiven. So often we, we don't know what really what we're doing. The second saying we see comes from Luke chapter 23, a little bit further, verse 43. And he says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Not only did Jesus forgive those that crucified him, but he also forgave one of the two thieves that were on the cross next to him. We see that as we read the Gospel of Luke in the context. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through verse 42, it records... Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded, and he said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. We see that one of the thieves had a change of heart on the cross. It's a good reminder. It's never too late to turn your heart over to Christ. We uh, would encourage you to do it before your last breath. But there's hope even for those that we would think they'll never come to Christ. How do we not know on their final breath they realize the errors of their way and realize the mercy and the grace of God. And so we realize that at this point, Jesus made a second statement from the cross, promising to forgive the repentant thief. Again, we see Jesus and his concern for others. The third statement comes from John chapter 19, verse 26. It's, Woman, behold your son. As Jesus continued to suffer upon the cross, he was continuing to think about others. He saw his mother, Mary, there, and one of his disciples, John, there as well, standing near. And he said, Woman, behold your son. And then he looked up at John and said, Behold your mother. And by saying this, he was entrusting his mother into John's care. That John, his friend, his disciple, would look after his mother to care for her, to take care of uh, those things that he was taking care of while he was on earth. It's interesting, the law required the firstborn son to take care of his parents. And here Jesus was obeying the law, even up to the very end. 
Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he emphasized how he came to fulfill the law. And we've seen this as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that's exactly what Jesus has done. He's fulfilled the Scriptures. He's fulfilled all the Old Testament. It points to him. So we honor and obey the law throughout his life. He also honored the law while he was suffering at his death, concern for others, concern for his mother. The fourth statement we see from the cross comes from Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's recorded for us this fourth saying of Jesus from the cross bystanders as he was crying out and in the language they understood at the time, thought he was calling for Elijah. And uh, the Old Testament prophet, but uh, it's fascinating as he is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually calling us back to Psalm chapter 22, the Psalm of David, recognizes the holiness of God just as Jesus is doing from the cross. He's recognizing that uh, the sin that he has now been placed upon him is causing separation from the Father. And I would say this is probably the most difficult one for us to understand. The sinless Son of God experiencing separation from all eternity, that intimate relationship we have with the Father, now experiencing there's a separation there. Our sin has spiritually separated the Son from the Father. And when the sins of the world were put on Jesus, there for the first time was that separation he experienced for us. The Bible records something happened then that we can only understand really through the eyes of faith. That uh, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God w- was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that Jesus became that sin offering for us. The Old Testament had foretold of a, a lamb offering. And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And here the Father was placing the sins of the world upon the Son in order that we could be forgiven of our sins. That everything in the universe had been affected by sin could now be made right with God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus was suffering that pain and that separation, really, that, that we deserve. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of in him. In order for that to occur, the Father had to forsake the Son at that point and punish him on our behalf. The wrath and the judgment that we deserve for our sins, for our wrongdoing, Christ took upon himself voluntarily because he loves us. He wants to forgive us of our sins. The fifth saying we see that Jesus made from the cross is, I thirst. And that comes from John chapter 19, verse 28. In this fifth statement he makes, it reminds us that although he is fully God, he's also fully human. And the Bible says in John chapter 19, at this time, knowing that all things were now accomplished, the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. We realize that he lived as a man who walked perfect on the planet earth. And yet he suffered willingly for you and for me in order that he could identify with humanity. There are times in life where we go through suffering and through pain and through hardships. And we may wonder, why, Lord, am I going through this trial? Why am I going through this suffering? And God may give us an answer of encouragement from the Scripture. It may be he wants us to remember what he's already done for us on the cross. That through something so horrific, that crucifixion on the cross, that something good came from that for you and for me. And maybe, just maybe, there's a sliver that whatever we're experiencing, whatever trial we're facing, that some good could come through that. Maybe there's someone that he wants us to minister to. Someone that's only willing to hear if someone else has gone through what they're experiencing. We won't know until we get to heaven. But we can realize that Christ, from this statement, suffered fully the effect of the Roman crucifixion. There was no easing the weight of our sins upon him. Our sins were fully placed upon him 
on the cross. The sixth statement comes from John chapter 19, verse 30, and we're going to camp and stay there a little bit longer than the others. The sixth statement was this cry of, of victory, in a sense, where he said, it is finished. And the Greek word there is tetelestai. It, it not only means it is finished, it also means paid in full. At that time, if you were in the marketplace and you went to buy something, you didn't have enough uh, shekels on you, enough coins, um, you would have a, a debt statement. And you would owe that debt until you were able to pay that debt in full. And if you came back and you had the, the, uh, the money to, to pay off your debt, they would write on that note to tell us die. Your debt was paid in full. It's finished. You don't owe anything else. In essence, that's what Jesus was doing. We consider the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. We can think of really several things that, that this connects to that has been paid in full or that it is finished. The first, Jesus finished the task the Father sent him to do, to come to this earth and accomplish, to provide salvation for you and for me and for all humankind. By living his entire life without sin, he became that perfect sacrifice for us. And we thought about this before. You had been the, the brother or the sister of Christ, and you know, your parents maybe have said, why can't you be more like your big brother Jesus? He's perfect. Hard to live up to. And yet he was perfect in everything that he did. And so the way of salvation had been made complete. No more animal sacrifices were needed to be made. They had been pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, and his offering on the cross for us. His was the supreme sacrifice which satisfied, satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God. The second thing we see accomplished is that it fulfilled prophecy. The Old Testament is just lined with scriptures, lots of lots of prophecy that pointed to the first coming of the Messiah. It also points to the second coming of the Messiah, but it predicted that he would come into the world as a suffering servant to rescue us, and he fulfilled that. And so we know the prophecies of God are always accurate, and they will come to pass, and Jesus fulfilled that. The Savior was promised. Christ the Savior had come and accomplished that perfect salvation. The third matter we see accomplished on Jesus' uh, death on the cross was the victory over the devil. The devil at that time thought he had won. The scripture says that one of the purpose of Jesus' coming was to destroy the works of the devil, according to 1 John 3.8. And so the death of Christ was that finished task. Dominion over the earth was through sin handed to the devil, but now it was won back. The authority that Satan had was vanquished. Victory had been won. And when Christ comes back again someday, that victory he won over the devil on, on Calvary's cross will be forever uh, permanent in a sense that we will be in his presence without uh, that sin affecting us anymore. The fourth and final reason that Jesus said it is finished is regard to his own suffering. Jesus spent over about 30, 33 years on the earth, living among sinful men, suffering the limitations of a human body and the existence and uh, the Jewish towns and, and the um, state of the Jewish affairs under Roman occupation and, and despised by many of his own people. And now he endured the final six hours of that suffering upon the cross. It was finished. No longer would he have to suffer the limits of space and time. It was finished. He had accomplished the work. Our sins were fully paid. It was finished. The seventh statement we see comes from Luke chapter 23, verse 46. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This final statement of Jesus comes right before his death, right before he breathes his last breath. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Everything had been accomplished. Everything that the Father had sent him to do was complete. And so with this final statement, we see it's time to demiss his spirit. Jesus previously made the statement, and I think this is important for us to realize, that no one took his life from him. He willingly laid it down for us. 
In John chapter 10, he said, uh, verse 17 and 18, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. We realize that in this last statement, Jesus entrusted his spirit into his Father's hands. It could not be taken from him. He willingly laid down his life for you and for me. And because he willingly went to the cross, he chose to die for us because he loves us. He desires for us to have fellowship with him, have a relationship with him. And so upon making this final statement, Jesus died. He did it for you. He did it for me. The book of Hebrews says that it was the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Many theologians have wrestled over what is that joy, that why he endured the cross. I believe that joy is knowing that he could have a relationship with you and me. The joy of having us be a part of his forever family. Again, we're not talking about religion. We're not talking about man trying to do works to attain salvation or enter heaven. We're talking about relationship. We could never make our way up to heaven. So God came down to rescue us, to redeem us. And so in closing, we see the seven statements Jesus made from the cross have significance for us today. They remind us, remind us of his death, not only that this is factual history that took place, but more than that, it's the supreme sacrifice that was for our sins. It was for our salvation. So these seven statements, these final words show us that we can have the confidence, not only as Christ as our Savior, but also as our Lord, as our God and our King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word and reflect upon these seven statements of our Lord and Savior on the cross. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son, born of the Virgin Mary, to live that perfect, sinless life that we never could, to willingly go to the cross to pay the debt of sin for us, all the wrongs we've ever done, things we know that were bad, the things we know we should do that we didn't do, and the things that we did do we knew we shouldn't have done. That Jesus, you paid for all of that. And you want us to simply trust in you, to receive you into our hearts and our lives, to walk with you. So God, we pray that you would continue to help us do just that. Lord, that you would draw us unto yourself. And God, we pray that there may be someone here tonight or maybe watching online who need to surrender their life to you. Lord Jesus, we pray that by your spirit, you would convict them of their sin and show them your amazing grace, your love for them, that you want to rescue them, forgive them, give them a new life with meaning and purpose. Adopt them into your forever family. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. I need to surrender my life to him. I need that relationship you're talking about. If that's you and you're ready to make the decision, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you surrender to Jesus. And you believe that he loves you, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the grave. If you're ready to do that, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me. That Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the grave. Lord, please forgive me of all my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. Help me from this day forward to follow you and put your spirit within me that I may do your will. 
God, thank you for knowing me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for adopting me into your family. And I thank you for being my Savior, my Lord, my King, and my friend. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, or perhaps a rededication, love to chat with you after service, pray with you, give you some resources, give you a Bible if you don't have one.